Will Michael Hall Jr. have a long career in the National Football League? You are Locked On Buckeyes, your daily podcast on the Ohio State Buckeyes. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome in, Buckeye fans, to a Thursday edition of Locked on Buckeyes here on Thursday, April 18th in the year 2024. I am your host, Jay Stevens, also the host of the Jay Stevens podcast. And today's episode is brought to you by Monopoly Go. I admit it. I have a competitive side. And it is a big it is a big fan of Monopoly Go, the mobile hit twist on classic Monopoly. So join your friends and download Monopoly Go now, free on the App Store or Google Play. Joining us like he has throughout a lot of the offseason this year, it's my favorite NFL draft analyst, Ryan Roberts. We've been working through numerous technical difficulties to simply get to this point in the show. And Ryan, today we're going to the defensive side of the ball for the Buckeyes. We talked about four draft eligible players for the Buckeyes already that some will get drafted some will not get drafted today it's about a couple guys on the defensive side of the ball we're starting off with Michael Hall Jr. we're a week away from the NFL draft it's crazy to think that and we're a week away from when Michael Hall Jr. I do believe will hear his name called in the NFL draft and I think he has an opportunity to have a long NFL career but things have to go right for him to make sure that happens how do you feel about that statement yeah, um, I, I think that it's going to be about development for Michael Hall Jr., right? I think that you were expecting after the 2022 season where there was a lot of positives. You know, like there were two to three games in 2022 where he just took over. Like he was the best player on the field, arguably, for the Buckeyes who had a very good defense in 2022 and again in 2023. I think it's about, for me, Jay, one, he needs to find the right system fits, you know, uh, as far as played a lot of one this past year for, for Ohio state played a lot of nose. I think he's a true three tech in a four man system. Right. And unfo- unfortunately for his evaluation, he played with Tyleek Williams this past year, who Tyleek plays a lot of three as well. So I think it's just kind of figuring out where you best fit first and foremost. But then I think it's about just physically developing further. Right. Because the thing about Michael Hall is that he has been a player that has played at kind of a lower weight. He's been around 280 pounds for the majority of, you know, for the majority of his Buckeye career, obviously. But during the draft process, he's steadily put on weight. And I, but man, I, I'm, I'm still bought into the athletic gifts. Like I still think that he's going to be a, a for sure top hundred pick. I think he's going to go in the first three rounds of the draft. I had just a little bit of context here. I had a scout during his senior bowl performance, right? It was like day two, day three, a senior bowl text me and said, quote unquote, now let's see if this happens. But he said, I don't think Michael Hall is going to get out of the second round. Like that, that was kind of what he had said to me. And then he goes to the, does, isn't able to participate in the combine, but then he goes to the pro day and he runs like four, seven, something at 280 plus fouls where you're just like, all right, guys, I think we got a live one here. Development still needs to take a step forward, obviously. He was a good player in 2023, but he did was not a he did not take a massive step forward for what we saw in 2022. But the athletic gifts are certainly there for Michael Hall to be a very good player, very impactful in the next level. You know, that part there talking about second around, him not getting out of it. I I easily see that. I think if last year went a little bit different, we're talking about a guy that could be pick number 30, number 32 in the first round, because I do believe he does possess a skill set that is unique, especially with him being undersized at the three tech and um, being a defensive tackle at that in that in that build. It's hard for you to be as good and as effective as he has been at times, not as consistent as we would like for him to be. But he has been a guy. You remember, you talk about that Notre Dame game a lot when you're on here talking about yep. Michael Hall Jr., about how he was disruptive and how he can simply just change the game but now it's the consistency. And I went to talk about the long NFL career earlier because I believe if he is more consistent, Ryan, he can be a guy that has a long NFL career. But also, if you think he can be more consistent, you pick him in the second round. I think that consistency word ties into him and how NFL people view him potentially being a second round pick. Well, at the end of the day, I would say very simply, right, is that the – weaknesses column or the areas of improvement column of a scouting report, you want it to be things that are teachable, right? I don't want it to say things like lacks first step explosiveness, lacks flexibility. Uh, Michael Hall has all those things. The unteachables is kind of what I call it, right? The things that you are just 
given with. You know, God has blessed you with those things. You want that column to say simply, technical refinements, needs to add mass to the frame, needs to play with a little bit more, you know, just kind of urgency with his hands, like those types of things, which is Michael Hall's scouting report right now as far as the areas Mm -hmm. of improvement. And the great thing about that is any defensive line coach worth anything on the next level and a strength and conditioning coach worth anything on the next level, they can improve all those things, right? Those things are, they are, they're, they're parts of his game that can be easily remedied is the best way to put it, right? So the fact that you see that, those guys go early, Jay. I mean, people bet on traits all the time. You have also, it's also not a, a fact of he's all traits and zero production. Like Michael Hall did have production. It was just more of a game by game perspective of inconsistencies, right? And again, I think that that was a little bit. And I mean, Jim Knowles is a great defensive coordinator and it worked, right? I mean, the Buckeyes just had one of the best defenses in all of college football this last year. But Michael Hall was asked to do a lot of the dirty work this last year, man. Like, played the point of attack, work against double teams. That's not necessarily his game on the next level. He is more of a one-gap attack-style defensive tackle. And if he finds that right system, all those unteachables he has, you can unlock those. And all the teachable things, they can be proved and remedied. So, again, that's why I think he's a slam dunk top 100 pick. And there are some NFL teams that I do believe have second-round grades on Michael Hall Jr. Do you see his weight being an undersized three tech being an issue in the NFL. It is only an issue if he's asked to do things that he shouldn't be asked to do. Right. Like if, if he gets drafted to a team, that's a three, four team, a three man front heavy exclusive team, that's going to be an issue, right? Because you need a little bit of eight uh, weight to anchor and mass to anchor at the point of attack. And those systems, you're going to be two gap a ton, unless you're attack style three, four system. And like, you just don't see that as much as far as being super aggressive with the three man front. But then the other part is if you're a four-man front, if they draft him to be a nose, it's like, uh, I think that that's a very misuse of talent. But mm-hmm. if they draft it as a three technique and a four-man front, if he can play between 285 and 295, somewhere in that ballpark, he's fine. He can last that way. Because the one thing that's pretty uncommon about Michael Hall, at least from my viewing of him on film, is he's really strong for his size, man. Like he For 280 pounds that he played around this past year at Ohio State, he was able to create a lot of movement with the pop in his hands and his lower body. So I think as long as he's able to play between 285 and 295, I don't think the weight will hurt as long as he's playing three technique on the next level. Ryan, lasting here with Michael Hall Jr., let's just say that he does get drafted and Ohio State's defense is getting a boost this year that it needs. Do you see a scenario? I'm thinking next year now, not this year with this D tackle. You get Michael Hall Jr. this year. Do you see a scenario next year where Ohio State starts four defensive linemen where three of the four guys that start this year are first or second round picks? I mean, it's possible that they have the upside to do that. I I would even put paint it like this, Jay. I would say the the defensive line this past year of JT Toy Molau, Jack Sawyer, Michael Hall, and Tyleek Williams – you could look back two years next year and be like, dang, man, we had we had four top 100 picks on that yeah. defensive line playing, you know, and, and that doesn't even count Ty Hamilton, who, you know, next year, Ty Hamilton might get drafted on day three as a kind of a rotational depth piece. Like, it's possible, right? So I think that the talent is outstanding. I mean, if I had the guess on round grades for those guys next year, look, man, I'll be very honest. I'm a big Ty Leak Williams fan. And if, yes, if Ty, Ty Leak puts it together for a second straight year, I wouldn't be shocked if he's a top 32 player next year. I wouldn't be shocked if he's a first rounder at all. JT, I think, is an interesting one because JT so refines, right? Like he is a just a really tactical rusher and he makes plays in the biggest games, which is always good, right? Like I just feel like every time they needed a play in a big moment in a football game, I think back to even the Notre Dame Ohio State game this past year, JT is the one that makes it, right? So I think that that's valued. I'd still, I'd say he's still more of a top 50 type of pick just mm-hmm. because. I don't think he's like super twitched up. I don't think he's a dynamic athlete. I just think he's a smooth athlete and really technical and really tactical is kind of the best way to put it. Jack Sawyer is still has upside as a pass rusher. You saw it a little bit this year. I think he had like six and a half sacks or something like that. Like you sort of see it a little bit more, but he's such a good run defender that the NFL is going to love Jack Sawyer. Right. So, but the question is, do they love him top 64? Do they love him top 75? Do they love him top 100? Regardless, though, I think that there's a very good chance that all four of the defensive linemen that started this year, the majority for Ohio State, will be top 100 picks when all is said and done, all of them. 
that's silly, bro. That is it silly. Is. Like it's crazy. Talking about. I mentioned Michael Hall Jr. in that conversation because those four that are going to start in the upcoming season, they were still like all five playing at some point together last year. And Ohio State's defense that was really good a year ago could easily yep. – all of the contributors, starters and contributors from last year, starters and contributors from this upcoming season all get drafted. We'll dive into a guy that had been a Buckeye for a very long time. Next, Ryan was low on him. And I'm curious if Ryan is still low on Josh Proctor. This episode is brought to you by Yahoo Finance. Wouldn't it be great if you could see all of your investment and retirement accounts in one place? With Yahoo Finance, you can consolidate your views from multiple accounts into one hub and access the expert analysis you need to tend to your entire portfolio with confidence. Let's get straight to the point. You want to grow your portfolio to deal with the rising costs of inflation, to pay off your debt or your mortgage, pretty much anything standing in the way of you and financial freedom, right? With Yahoo Finance, you can get access to the news, data, and tools that you need in order to help reach that financial freedom. For more than 25 years, Yahoo Finance has been the brand behind every great investor, whether you're a seasoned investor or are looking for that extra guidance, Yahoo Finance gives you all the tools and data you need in one place. Securely link your brokerage accounts for a unified view of your wealth, including 401k and other investments. A comprehensive perspective is what sets apart great investors, and it's how Yahoo Finance ensures you have the insight to look at your wealth in its entirety. For comprehensive financial news and analysis, visit the brand behind every great investor, yahoofinance.com. The number one financial destination, yahoofinance.com. That's yahoofinance.com. Are you watching Fox Sports or ESPN on your TV all day? Have to turn down the volume with all that shouting? Make the switch to Locked On Sports today. A free 24-7 sports streaming channel program for you every day to bring you the biggest stories without all the screaming. Locked On Sports today brings you can't-miss analysis, opinions, and news. Streaming 24-7 on the YouTube or the free Amazon Fire TV channels app, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team, every day. Ryan Proctor is one of those guys that been at Ohio State for a really long time. I remember back 2019 Victim Championship game against Wisconsin, the Buckeyes win. Very last play of the game. I forget who Wisconsin's quarterback was, but he got blasted by Proctor, um, blew him up near the – it was near the end zone, like the maybe five-yard line. He just blew him up. Quarterback ran for whatever reason, like game's over. And I'm like, okay, like he'll be out of Ohio State in the very next year. Literally thought 2020 – draft he would be gone or 2021 draft excuse me no it didn't happen injuries hit him um his own play had to get better for him to get drafted as well his play did get better this past year and I think NFL scouts and looks like yourself wanted to see the improvement we got from Josh Proctor a year ago yeah well Jay we first talked about him two years ago right where I was like you know I kind of like this Proctor kid man yeah. I kind of like him 41's moving I, I, I like him he's a very talented player and as you mentioned, the injuries the last couple of years, I think it's hurt his athleticism a little bit. I don't think he's quite as explosive as maybe he once was, but I think he played really well this year. I did. I think he played really well. And the big thing that Proctor now has in his favor is he tested pretty well. I think he ran like four five five at the combine. Like can't just kind of hit thresholds and requisite numbers, right? That you need at the position. But the big thing that he has in his advantage not a very good safety class man like it's just it's really not so and it's not a great depth class overall in day three right so i know the next question is going to be about being drafted right and, and where or, or a couple questions from now maybe about being drafted i think he's going to get drafted i do yeah. i think he'll get drafted because the depth of this class and the safety group is just not a great group this year right so i was thinking he'll get drafted because of what he showed on film a year ago yep. it showed that he has improved. And it, I didn't think the factor would be he just in a weak safety class. So that's the bigger factor here for him. Oh, and that's a bigger factor than his play in his film. Cause I think it's, even though his film was better, I still think if I'm an NFL executive or a scout or a coach, I need my medical team to do everything they need to do and go the, the extra mile because right. you don't want to draft a guy that has injury issues, you draft them higher than expected 
because you don't do your due diligence in the medical side of things, but all of a sudden you get him there during training camp, he gets hurt again, and you're kicking yourself because you didn't do your own job to check his medicals. So I do think his medicals hurt him. His film helps him, but also what helps him is the safety class is a little weak, so he could get, I would love to say sixth round. I could see seventh round for him maybe being more of a solid spot, but where's your thoughts right now about where he might land in the draft? Sixth and seventh was literally what I was going to say to that okay. question, right? Because I, I think that what he has going in, and the, the positive here is usually this time of year, you start hearing about guys like the whispers start having as far as guys that didn't pass medicals or have shoddy medicals, because you're absolutely correct. This is the time of year where they do everything, you know, like they at the combine, they're pulling their prod in, they're doing every single test, you know, they're measuring bone density, they're checking in on past injuries, they're doing everything, right? Like it's a very daunting process from the medical check perspective. And then during these 30, 30 visits, when the teams are bringing them in, they'll have their own medical teams check them as well in, in that process as well. So I th I haven't heard anything negative on Proctor at this point. So that's a good sign. That that means that maybe there's it's not as serious as maybe we thought it could potentially be. But I really think that on the film, as long as the medical isn't as medical isn't a problem, I think he can make a roster. Like I really yeah. do. I'm not I'm not willing to stand up here and say he'll eventually become a starter or be a, you know, a, 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 a legitimate producer at the position. But I do think that he has requisite size, athleticism and impact on special teams that he will stick on a roster as a death piece, as a safety. I would actually be kind of surprised if he didn't last for a couple of years, because I just think that he brings enough all around. There isn't a major hole in Josh Proctor, right? Like the, the major hole is the medicals. That's the only right. major hole. I mean, like he's a very sound run defender. He has pretty good eyes and instincts as a safety. He has pretty solid requisite range and athleticism on the back end. He does everything pretty well. Does he do anything elite? No. But does he do everything pretty well? Yes. And that matters for a lot of NFL teams, especially when you're picking on day three. I think it does matter. I think it matters a lot. For Proctor, his experience, we talk about it in basketball. Well, they used to have this thing in basketball where you want to draft a, first, a guy that's played one or two years in college basketball versus a guy that's been there four or five years getting the uh, the younger guy, the fresher guy over the guy that's the vet and been more experienced. He could be 23 or 24 years old versus 18, 19, 20 years old. So you're trying to figure out, like, what's the right move? Is it the young guy who's fresher, has fresher legs, or the guy who's more experienced? You might not have as long in the NBA, but he's more ready-made to play right now. For Proctor, I think he's played six years in college football. He took advantage of a red shirt, took advantage of that yep. COVID year, and I think he needed to do all of those things to get to where he is right now. How do people in the NFL, especially when it comes to the draft, view a player yep. that has played six years in college football? Different positions, it matters differently, right? Like for a running back, for instance, it is a very big negative because it's the shelf life thing, right? It's getting to a second contract. It's that's the little bit of a tough part as far as investment perspective. For a guy that's a safety that you need a lot of reps to play that position yeah. overall, because you are, I mean, let's be honest, right? Like we always you know, just point at the middle linebacker as far as being the the brain of a defense and getting everybody set up. But the safety has a lot on their on their in their hands too, man, because you need to know what the corners are doing. You need to know what second level's doing. You need to know what the pressure package is up front. You need to know all the coverage shells. Like it's a very instinctual and very it's a position that it depends so much of what you know and how quickly you can process things. So so in that sense Experience matters a lot. It really yeah. does. I mean, there's not a coverage that Proctor hasn't run, right? There's not a scheme that he hasn't seen. There's not a a coverage variation that he hasn't varied, you know? Like there isn't a there isn't a passing concept that he hasn't seen unfold in front of his eyes. That stuff really matters, right? That stuff really matters. And especially when we're talking about day 3 picks again, right? Where it's like getting to a second contract matters so much for those guys because they're not getting paid what the first, second, even third rounders are. Like they are depth pieces and they need to be able to stick long term to maximize their profit and money. But from an NFL from an NFL perspective, from a team perspective, I'm not really worried about older safeties. I'm not, you know, as a, especially as a depth player, I need a guy that I can count on potentially trying to get to a second contract. This isn't a a, a one size fits all. Obviously there's some teams that do have age thresholds overall, but those age thresholds, 
they they kind of disappear a little bit for most teams yeah. on day three, especially in the age of the COVID rule. I mean, like we are almost out of this luck. I think the 2025 NFL draft. So next year is the last year that we have to talk about the COVID year. Thank God. So we're almost there. Right. But so I think that people have kind of accepted the reality that there are going to be six year seniors this year. There were six year seniors last year. There's be six year seniors next year. And that age threshold, I think, is diminished a little bit, at least over the past couple of drafts. Ryan, there's a thing I would like to do with you next. That's in regards to the upcoming Buckeye football team and a slight change to the Buckeyes offensive line that might need to happen. We'll dive into that very topic next. This episode is brought to you by Monopoly Go. Guys, I need you all to listen up for this huge announcement. I have been tracking the leaderboards every day, keeping my eye on the scores, putting all my heart into it, and I'm super pumped to announce I am finally on top. That's right. Obviously, I'm talking about the hit mobile game Monopoly Go. You've probably heard of it. It's been downloaded over 150 million times. It's a great mobile twist on classic Monopoly. You can play anywhere anytime you explore hundreds of monopoly boards from las vegas to camelot to the moon all while raking in a huge fortune charge rent on iconic properties just like classic monopoly you can charge your friends rent on your iconic properties or go after their monopoly money by pulling bank heists and taking wrecking balls to their landmarks but my favorite part is the leaderboards where you can see who's a Monopoly tycoon and who's gone bankrupt. So go get yourself on the charts. Download Monopoly Go now, free on the App Store and Google Play. This episode is also brought to you by our friends at Billiards Plus. Billiards Plus has the best selection of pool tables, game tables, shuffleboard tables, and more. And the best service in Central Ohio. Everything you need for in-home and backyard entertainment is at Billiards Plus. Billiards Plus carries the best pool tables from Brunswick, Ahasen, Canada, Billiards, and more. And the grills, whether you like charcoal or gas or wood-fired, Billiards Plus has a perfect setup for all grillers. They are family-owned and operated. And when you talk to the staff at Billiards Plus, you know you're talking to an expert who won't steer you wrong. No matter the season, Billiards Plus has you covered for all your indoor and outdoor entertainment needs. Kenny. Sarah and the whole staff will always go above and beyond to give you the best customer service in the industry. Billiards Plus, visit their showroom on Dublin Center Drive in Dublin. Ryan, I was not going to do a Josh Fryer segment with you for seven, eight minutes, but he is going yeah. to be a big factor in this next little experiment we're going to do. I am not pleased with the Buckeyes offensive line. I think you and I have talked previously and maybe even on the show in regards mm -hmm. to maybe some reshuffling that might need to happen, maybe players playing out of position. One of my yeah. buddies mentioned something about Donovan Jackson, and I was like, wait, okay. I don't know if I really think it's a good idea, but I'm going to throw it at you to hear your thoughts about it. Left to right side. I'm just going to throw this little starting five at you, and let's hear your thoughts about it. Left tackle is Josh Simmons. Left guard is Josh Fryer. Center is Carson Hensman. Right guard is, is uh, Seth McLaughlin. Right tackle is Donovan Jackson. What do you think about that? So uh, but, but the, the positives, what I like about that, Jay, is that you got Seth McLaughlin not to have to snap ever again, which is good. That's a, that's a good strategy there. Because I actually we're, saw we're that trying to make list. that happen, Ryan. I, I, I saw a... I saw a lineup, or at least it was some talk about it during spring practice that they had Hinsman playing guard and they had McLaughlin at center. Where I was just like, "Oh no, they're doing that. Why are why are they doing that? I don't understand. It doesn't make any sense. He has experience at guard. Put him at guard." Look, the Donovan Jackson thing. A, I, I struggle moving guys that haven't mastered the position that they already play. You know mm. what I mean? And I honestly like I I don't is. Donovan Jackson more suited to play offensive tackle on the college level than Josh Fryer. Probably, right? Like, probably. He's a little more athletic. He's probably longer, too. I mean, I feel like his arm length is better than Fryer's, just kind of based on the naked eye, right? Like, I, I think that that's probably a fact. So, I think functionally for the Buckeyes, it would make sense. But I do think that there's, like, the human side of it where it's like, are you doing what's best for Donovan Jackson? You know what mm. I mean? And if I'm Donovan Jackson, I'm also, I'm kind of thinking in the back of my mind, because although they're not allowed to officially sign with agents and so after the season, you know that they're talking to an agent right now. Right. <laughs> yes. And they have that lined up. Like, let's be honest. Right. And I think that in that conversation and agents, 
Donovan Jackson are probably like, I don't think that's beneficial for me. Like, who's that more beneficial for? And, and so I, I think that the long term of his own reality, I think, might be something that would make him a little bit uneasy. But if you're asking me, is that a better option than having Josh Fry at right tackle? My initial impulse is yes. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. But obviously, there's a player involved here and his future involved. So that's kind of where it gets hairy. But it, but quite simply, baseline, do I think that having Proctor at left guard and Donovan Jackson at right tackle is better than having the reverse? Yes, I do. I do believe that that's better. And Hinsman at center is much better than having Seth McLaughlin. I agree on that 100% as well. You know, they've been shuffling that a little bit more than I think people may think. Yep. Uh, Hinge been being in a starting lineup because for a while, I mean, you mentioned before the show, Luke Montgomery, and I was like, not really. Like, I'm not really all in on him starting this year. I yeah. am all in on finding a way for Carson Hinge to play the football. If they put Seth McLaughlin out there at center, I could see an easy thing. Game two, maybe game three, moving Hensman and McLaughlin, like literally swapping them spots. Hensman goes back to center, McLaughlin at guard, simply because I think it's a better long-term fix for Ohio State this year, but also for mm-hmm. those players at the, at the next level. I think they're better suited for center for Hensman and McLaughlin at guard. The yeah. question mark for me, though, is Jackson. Like, I know we all, we both know Josh Fryer is better at guard than tackle. I think yeah. a lot of people that are out there believe that to be true. Sure. Is Donovan Jackson the se- first or second best option at guard? That's my question right now. And I don't know. Like, I, we're not trying to dive into the Buckeye film. You watch enough film on these guys like, to know what kind of players they are. I don't know if he's the best option. But also, I think if you put him at tackle, it's almost like, well, we want to play him. Put him at tackle. Is it yeah. the best thing for the team? Maybe. Is it going to be rocky earlier? Yes. You got a few games to get till you get to Oregon, but also mm-hmm. you got to try. You want to figure it out before you get to Game Three or Game Four. You have to play Iowa before yeah. that too. So that's a tough team in it in itself. I know it's a time to make that move if you're going to make it, but Donovan yeah. Jackson's. I was down on him last year, and I'm not really much higher on him right now. He's regressed. He has regressed. I remember when he was a retro freshman, ever, or I guess he was technically a sophomore because he played a little bit as a freshman, I think, over the four game limit. But when his first year as a starter, everyone loved that guy, man. Yeah, they were yeah. talking about him like he was going to be the next big thing. And he still might end up being the next big thing. I don't know. But I've seen regression in him or at least stagnation in him the last couple of years. Like I just haven't seen him take jumps, which is very unsettling. It's unsettling, isn't it? Because he's one guy on the because in my opinion i don't know if you agree with this josh simmons is an okay talent he's got solid talents you know the playing left tackle right josh fryer is not an overly talented guy he's just a really strong physical dude that that plays well in tight spaces right but i would argue between donovan jackson and carson hinsman those are probably your two most talented offensive linemen right and for mm-hmm. whatever reason Donovan Jackson hasn't gotten a ton better. Now, I, I'm not trying to throw shade on, on Justin Fry. I still do believe that Justin Fry is a good offensive line coach, but why is that happening? Why, why, right. why hasn't he shown potential growth? So it's going to be fascinating to see because we're now in the spring portal opening, right? I mean, and there's some offensive tackles that are entering the portal right now. So does Ohio State go out and get a guy that they feel can come and compete at right tackle, and then maybe you make that move at Fryer. Regardless, it's going to be – Actually, let me say it like this. Regardless, Ohio State needs to find out what the issue is on offensive line recruiting and development and figure it out quickly. They have to because, I mean, I I didn't watch the spring game, Jay, but like the things I had read and people had told me and people that I trust that told me not just kind of like trolls on Twitter was that the Ohio State wide receivers are dope. The Ohio State defense is dope. But the offensive line is just still an issue, man. Like, it's yeah. still a major issue. And they have to figure that out because they have enough talent to compete for a national championship in 2024. But they need to really figure out that position. I know quarterback is, you know, was, I think I think they threw, like, what, four or five interceptions in the game. So, like, it was a little bit hit or miss. But, like, offensive line is the spot that I think if you get that thing figured out, then having the two-headed running back duo that you have, having all these receivers that you have, and having a Will Howard who's – at least functional of a college quarterback that can make some plays. You know what I mean? So whatever the issue is, they really need to figure it out on the offensive line because it is not been great. 
the last couple of years, man, it, especially after Paris Johnson and Dewan Jones left after uh, before le- last season. Oh gosh. Oh gosh. I th- Imagine if Luke Whipler stayed though. Like if Luke Whipler stayed and did not go. I like, I like Luke. I love Luke Whipler, man. I you do. That's why I bring him up. Yeah. I think the yeah. O-line <laughs> issues aren't as, I think they still have them, but they yeah. aren't viewed the way they currently are because you have a guy who is more experienced, who stayed at Ohio State, you're not trying yeah. to piece together, put in three new old linemen out of a five starting lineup set like Luke Whippler just. Now, great, he went to the NFL. Great, good for him. Yeah. Drafted by the Browns, which once again, good for him staying in that portion of the of the state of Ohio. Um, great for him to get drafted in the NFL. But Luke Whippler leaving was one of those things that hurt him. Ryan, I got one thought for you before you yes. wrap up the show. It's about the Let's quarterbacks. Uh oh. Ryan Day said Julian yeah. Sain is in the mix of the quarterback competition right now. Now, I don't know if that means he's in the mix as being the third or fourth option out of uh, four guys in the competition, or he's yeah. in the mix being someone that can legitimately win the job. But do you think, Ryan Day, if Julian Sand is the best option at quarterback, should start him? If he's the best option at quarterback, should he start him? The answer is yes. I, I, I'm a big believer in always – playing the better player, right? And I, I'm always in favor of that, especially in, like, we throw shade at Ryan Day all the time, right? And, and it, a lot of it's justified, but Ryan Day and Chip Kelly combined is an extremely strong offensive mind, right? Like, yes. that is, so it's a, and it's a quarterback-friendly one as well. I mean, both mm-hmm. those guys have gotten a lot out of quarterbacks over their years. They have. So if, if for whatever reason, Julian Sain had to start in 2024, I think he would be good. I think he'd be pretty good, especially for a freshman. I think that you can get a lot out of him. I liked Carlsbad, I think, is where he went in high school out of the state of California. I like Julian Sane a ton. I think he's a really talented player, man. A really talented player. So if he had to play, I think he could. I think the problem that you're going to run into, though, is that it's like starting a rookie quarterback in the NFL. I remember like Ben yes. Roethlisberger when he was great as a rookie in the NFL with the Steelers. In the playoffs, though, in the biggest moment, he wilted because he just was never there before, right? Like he had never had that experience. He wasn't ready for that much criticism and that much just that big of a moment the magnitude right and that's what i would worry about with julian saying in year one is that in those big moments are you ready to make those plays because again ohio state trying to win a championship in 2024 and they have enough roster talent on both sides of the ball to potentially win a national championship they do they have more than enough talent so i think that that's why you that's why i think that's why that ohio state went to the portal for a guy like a will howard again I am not like super high on Will, but Will's played a lot of college football, obviously, right? Like he's seen, he's played in some big games. He's seen, he's seen a lot of football at this point. So I think that for the best for the team is that Will Howard is a good player in 2024. But if at some point, let's say they drop a game early or they drop a couple games and they lose when they're not supposed to, would I turn the tide to Julian Sane if he's ready to play? I probably would at that point, but I would be more patient with him just because I think that the winning window for Ohio State is now, and I do think that Will Howard gives you a better chance in 2024 to win a national championship than what Julian Sane will as a true freshman. Really appreciate Ryan coming on the show and getting past all of the technical difficulties to simply get us to start the show today. You can follow Ryan on X at Rise, a letter in draft. You can follow me on the same platform at jsteven07. Send every single email to jstevens317 at gmail.com. We're out of here, Buckeye fans. We'll see you tomorrow.